Hi, this is Sue Glenn, and we are talking about diversity. And in this particular lecture, we are on the topic of uh, how disturbance is related to species diversity in a community. And this is from chapter 16.4 in the textbook Ecology um, by uh, Manuel Moles and Anna Scher, eighth edition uh, that is uh, published by McGraw Hill in 2019. There's been some controversy about how you actually define what a disturbance is. Uh, and uh, it's really something that's different from what you normally have. So it's something that's a departure from your average conditions. And uh, but your average conditions can have a lot of variability. So that makes it uh, uh, even harder to sort of figure out what you would call a disturbance. Uh, Wayne Souza defined a disturbance as discrete, punctuated, killing, displacement, or damaging of one or more individuals that directly or indirectly creates an opportunity for new individuals to be established. So that could be a windstorm blowing over trees, which allows new trees to grow there, or it could be a flood that's going to um, actually uh, wipe out the plants that were growing along the riverbank and allow uh, new seedlings to get established. White and Pickett define disturbance as a relatively discrete event. So it's something that happens at a sort of beginning and end time um, that disrupts the ecosystem, the community, or the population structure, and it'll change the resources. Could be changing the substrate availability or in some way changing the physical environment, any of these things. And uh, it has it can be defined by two major characteristics. You could be looking at the frequency of the disturbance. So that's how often they come. And so you, you have a different scenario if you're having fires every 10 years versus fires every 100 years. And then the intensity of the disturbance. When you're having the fires, is this a very hot crown fire or is it a much cooler ground fly, fire that is just clearing off debris on the soil surface? We know that disturbances happen. Connell proposed that disturbance is a prevalent feature that is going to significantly influence the diversity of a community. And that both high levels and low levels of diversity of disturbance would reduce diversity. So if you have a lot of disturbances, you're going to only have the things that can live there that can withstand those frequent flyers or frequent storms. And if you've got low levels of diversity or disturbance, the species that you find there are going to be the ones that are the good competitors that are able to take over the space undisturbed. The intermediate disturbance hypothesis proposes that at intermediate levels of disturbances, you get your highest diversity, which means there's enough time between disturbances to allow a large number of species uh, to come in and colonize, but not long enough to allow competitive exclusion to take place. So Wayne Souza actually set up an experiment to look at this um, and see if the uh, intermediate levels of disturbance had the highest diversity by looking at diversity of algae and invertebrates growing on boulders in the intertidal zone where the tides are coming in and out. And the uh, boulders were going to be rolled and moved around by the tide moving and the waves moving. And the large boulders require more force to move, so they're going to be less disturbed and the small boulders are going to be the most disturbed and the intermediate sized ones should be subjected to intermediate levels of disturbance. So this is Wayne Souza's data and it's going to take us a little bit just to get our head around uh, what this is showing us. So we've got three graphs that are going from a high level of disturbance. Uh, so these are uh, uh, smaller boulders to a low level of disturbance. These are the large boulders that are difficult to uh, roll around. And then we have the intermediate sized boulders, which are in your intermediate level of disturbance. And then um, the y-axis is showing us the percent of boulders that have different numbers of species. So um, here in these uh, small boulders, we can see that a highest percentage of the boulders had only one species on them. So uh, very, very few boulders had uh, four or five species on them, and no boulders had six or seven species. So there were none over here in these higher categories. And uh, where you have your most uh, 
uh, boulders is falling into the one species category on the boulder. So only one species was able to withstand the high levels of disturbance. When we go to the opposite end, where we have low disturbances, uh, we can find uh, that once again, we've got uh, very few species or very few boulders had six or seven, none had seven species, and very few had uh, five or six species. And uh, we really, we have our peak here at most boulders had two species on them. And then we look in the middle, and these are the intermediate sized boulders. And on the intermediate sized boulders, sometimes they're rolling around, sometimes they're not. None of the boulders only had one species in. A few of them had um, a lot of species in them. And you actually find that the uh, modal number, the highest number of boulders, the most percentage of boulders, had four species on them. So we did find that this uh, intermediate um, size of boulder that was uh, um, not rolling around constantly but not sitting still constantly was the one that had um, more species found on it. This is a different kind of disturbance. Here we have a biotic source of disturbance. So uh, we've got prairie dogs that are disturbing areas on North American prairies, and they dug these, uh, they did these extensive burrow systems, and you can see uh, around the the prairie dogs uh, hole, there's a little mound here, and they've eaten all the vegetation around there. And uh, they want to be able to see when they're, when they're sitting up on top of the mound, there's a guy back here sitting on top of the mound, you can see them here and here. They can see if any predators are coming, and that way they know to dive down their holes. So they, they are um, removing the vegetation. This is opening the area for colonization of, of new plants can move in there and start growing. And uh, and so it has having these intermittent prairie dog towns have uh, increased the diversity because you have different species of plants growing here than you have in the surrounding grassland. Um, pest control prob uh, programs reduce the prairie dog populations of North America by 98%. Uh, these holes obviously were not great for cattle. If they got their foot down there, they could break a leg. And so uh, they wiped out 98% of them. And this uh, had eliminated these dynamics uh, with the plant community. Because uh, when the prairie dogs had eaten everything in this area, they could extend their burrow system to another spot. And uh, they also had interactions with the bison who would come and roll in these areas for their little dust baths and, and form buffalo walls. There was a lot going on in this. And, and uh, by eliminating this one species, which was disturbing the prairie, you're going to reduce the diversity in the temperate grasslands. Now, when we look through the literature on this, there's uh, some literature that shows us intermediate levels of disturbance uh, have the highest diversities. Um, there's also places where we have found that higher diverse or higher disturbances will have lower diversity. Uh, this was a paper that I found that was finding that there were two peaks. There was a peak at an intermediate amount of disturbance and at a high amount of disturbance in diversity. So there's still a lot of research to be done on this. And it's still a field that uh, we really have to understand because if you're setting up an area to protect a community, um, you have to understand the role of disturbance in that community. You don't want to be eliminated eliminating all the disturbances and then finding out is taken over by just the most dominant competitor. And uh, the, the plants and animals you might have been trying to protect there may have been uh, outcompeted. So we've talked about um, the impact of disturbance on diversity. Previous lectures covered the idea of species abundance and the long normal distribution of species. Uh, we've also talked about species diversity and the rank abundance curves and the diversity index and the role of environmental heterogeneity, environmental complexity um, on diversity and different niches, uh, species having different niches, uh, both plants and, and animals. Uh, the picture in the background here is uh, to remind me to talk a little bit about uh, increases amount of disturbances. We're having more catastrophic events with climate change. Um, uh, you get more heat in the atmosphere, heat in the ocean. You're going to have more storm uh, events coming through, and uh, you're going to have more flooding events. This is a, a 
a flood that was caused actually by a, an earthquake in Japan in 2011. Uh, this was the uh, Fukushima area where the nuclear power plant got flooded. And, uh, and there's often interactions in these things. Um, you can see here the water is black and it, it turns out it was black because a lot of silt had washed into the oceans in this area off land and farming and things like that and that silt was being carried up by the tsunami which knocked people over and knocked buildings over and caused much more destruction so understanding disturbance uh, is going to be more important as we move into the future so take a look at the concept review questions at the end of each uh, concept section of the chapter. For uh, this section, it was uh, the three questions at the end. Take a look at uh, the chapter review questions at the end and the investigating the evidence on 23 about finding peer-reviewed uh, literature.